It's so good to be here with you guys this morning, and I um, have joked with Tom that I'm, I'm only here just to prepare the way for his re-entry next week since he's been gone for a while. Um, I'm, I'm honored to be here. I'm, I'm Deandre Adair, for you guys who do not know. I'm a Methodist clergy person here in this conference. I'm not appointed to this uh, congregation, but they've been very kind to welcome me into, um, into this, this community. Um, my work now is beyond the local church, and I work with families who have had children who have died. And um, I run a nonprofit called A Memory Grows. And so, um, you know, the work in which I do every day um, has a lot of sadness to it. And so my heart is very heavy this morning, and I don't really know what to do with it, but I feel like I need to speak of it. And, I, you know, you want to fix things, and we can't fix everything and we can't fix the world in which we live but I was incredibly heartbroken this morning when I woke up and I saw that the young girl um, from Lancaster who the Amber Alert had been out about um, this week um, her body was found this morning um, in an abandoned home in Oak Cliff only 13 years old I believe Um, her name is and always will be Siobhan Randall and so I want us to take just a minute to remember her and to remember her family. I would like to also remember the family of Caitlin Cargill. Um, Caitlin is the the young girl whose body was found in the Arlington landfill just a week and a half ago. And these are two young lives cut way too short. And two families who on a a weekend in which we celebrate and we come together and we watch fireworks and we celebrate the freedom that we have Uh, We also have the freedom to speak names and to remember and to honor. And so um, at this moment, I'd just like to um, ask that we have just a minute of silence and we remember Caitlin and Siobhan. May God's love and God's peace sustain and surround not just these girls, but the legacy that they leave and the families that carry them. Amen. So you may have seen a different kind of story over the past couple weeks, and I um, thank God for stories like this, (laughs) Um, because... um, it reminds you that there is still goodness and there is still humanity um, in this world. And and it's it's the kind of story that gives me hope in these days when I do not even want to read the front page of the paper. I don't want to receive a news update on my phone about a tweet that just went out. I don't want to hear anything that's casting judgment or spewing some kind of not nice word against someone else in this world. And that seems to be all we hear about. It seems like there's death and there's terrorism and there's more and more and more hate. And I've never been one to bury my head in the sand and want to hide from what's going on in the world. But I have to admit that these days that we live in are a little bit scary to me. And I don't pay as close of attention to the news as I used to. But this story caught my eye, and it caught my eye because it was local. It's about a young 20-year-old man who lives in uh, the North Dallas area, and he walked to work every single day to a Mexican food restaurant. Did anybody hear this story? Okay. Did it make you feel happy? (laughs) Uh, Okay. (laughs) Um, I get this look, and so that means yes. Um... So he, he's 20 years old, he lives in North Dallas, he walks to work every day, six miles each direction, to go to work at a Mexican food restaurant. He doesn't own a car, he'd been saving money for one, and he'd saved up about $1,000, but he had not quite gotten to the goal of being able to buy one yet. So a more, one morning recently, there was another man who was driving his car to work, and he saw this gentleman walking along the road, and so he stopped. He was very brave. He was uh, more brave than I. Um, He stopped, and he offered him a ride, and the young man jumped in and said, oh, yes, I would love a ride, and so they started talking, and 
Uh, they both shared their stories with each other, and when they got to the Mexican food restaurant, the um, the driver uh, dropped him off and told him to have a good day. But he had a feeling that he just could not let go of. And so he posted about his encounter with this young man on social media, which is, you know, a great um, blessing and a great curse as well. But um, within 48 hours, um, people had heard of this story and enough money had come in to buy this young man a car and to not only buy him a car, but to pay for his first year of insurance and to give him a $500 gift card for gas. And so they, these people came together in this community and they went to the Mexican food restaurant. And so the young man is getting off work and he's clocking out and he's getting ready to walk home. And he looks out in the parking lot, there's all these people <laughs> gathered that he doesn't know. He's like, what is going on here? And so he walks out and there's the guy that gave him the ride to work a couple days um, before, and he said he cannot believe something like that would happen to him. There's a, a video online of him uh, giving the two uh, business guys that made this happen a big hug and walking to this car with just tears streaming down his face. And so, you know, there there is goodness still in this world, and there is uh, love that is to be shared, and there are bright spots. But I, I think one of the most important things that we have to remember is that if the moment is not seized and we don't take the time to hear one another's stories, as Sharp talked about last week, then we miss so, so much. We miss a lot for ourselves, but we also miss so much that can be given to us by another person, by just listening to another. There was a band many, many years ago called CNC Music Factory. This dates me. Uh, well, all right. I'm glad somebody else knows of them. Um, uh, and they sang a song called Things That Make You Go, Hmm. And I, I thought that that might be kind of fun for the band to sing, like before the sermon. But then I looked up the lyrics and was reminded that they're not necessarily appropriate for a church uh, Sunday morning service. But the title, the title stuck. And it has stuck with my head since uh, I think I was like in seventh grade or something like that. So um, there are lots of things in this world that make me go, hmm. And um, a lot of them come from, um, I come from a long line of people watching experts, as we like to say in the D.A.R.E. family. Uh, we just like to observe the human population and sit back and watch. You can find my dad at a mall doing this just about every day. I've decided that maybe some people may think he's kind of creepy because he just sits <laughs> and, and watches. But um, it does provide good conversation for on down the road. line. Other things that made me go, hmm, is the beauty of a sunset of a sunrise, the way the moon and the stars somehow light up the night sky and remind me of how small I am, the continued mystery of genetics as to why we are who we are, why my cats seem to find my dirty laundry is the best bed in the house and lay upon it. I don't know why, but all of these things make me go, hmm. And then we turn to scripture. And many of the scriptures make me do the exact same thing because they open up for me a very curious side that helps me to understand that we're not all that different, not here in this room. We, are all, we all have things that are way more common than we do different. But we also are not all that different from the words and the people that we read in the Bible. From those who shared words and proverbs and wisdom so long ago that we still open up a book and read from it today. We are able to see that the struggles that we have are real, the struggles that they had we often share. But because we see this and see that we have this common humanity, we also see that these struggles are not insurmountable and that we are still here and we are still carrying on for generations and generations because we hold on to a grace that we sometimes can't put words to, and we live into these stories that we share. The stories of Jesus were so contrary to the time in which he lived, they're quite contrary to the time in which we live as well. And yet, for me, they're hopeful, because they always point us back and remind us to what is true, what is authentic in this life, and how much love there is between relationships that we share. And that there is a joy that cannot otherwise be found unless, as we look at that Mark scripture, 
it's looked at with the awe of a child. And so <clears throat> I spoke of the story of the young man at the Mexican food restaurant at his new car. And that was a story that went viral. And viral is a word that we hear about a lot these days. I used to think a virus was just like a virus. But uh, now viral, everything's viral on the internet. And it seems that even obituaries have gone viral these days. Um, and um, the, those who write them are making for sure that they're, um, the people that they are writing about are remembered one way or the other. This past presidential election, there were obituaries that claimed that the cause of death was because of the election itself. And it went on both sides. Um, and then there's this one that popped up back in January. And I actually sent it to Tom. Um, I don't think Tom ever sleeps, um, and I, I, I do sleep, but I don't go to bed before midnight. And so we have this running joke that if the phone like beeps after 11, it's, it's Tom. And so I sent him this obituary when I read about it, and then I secretly wished that I wouldn't have because I knew he was going to preach about it, and that I wouldn't have anything to say. <coughs> Excuse me. But thankfully he did it. So here we go. This man, Leslie Ray... Popeye Charping of Galveston, Texas. He died on January 30th, 2017 after a fight with cancer at the age of 74. According to his obituary, he lived 29 years longer than expected and much longer than he deserved. <laughs> he leaves behind two relieved children, <laughs> six grandchildren, and countless other victims, including an ex-wife, relatives, friends, neighbors, doctors, nurses, and random strangers. <laughs> and it all goes downhill from there. <laughs> At a young age, he quickly became a model example of bad parenting combined with illness and a complete commitment to drinking, drugs, generally offensive. <laughs> he also had a handful of run-ins with the law. This was printed, okay? I'm not making this up. I could not make something like this up. According to the Harris County Court records, his first conviction dates back to 1979 when he pleaded guilty to assault. He also pleaded guilty in 2008 to assaulting a family member by pouring hot liquid on his then wife of 40 years. The next year, he pleaded guilty to violating the resulting restraining order by calling another family member and threatening her. According to the obituary, despite being deeply intelligent, he lacked ambition, squandered the savings, and chased get-rich-quick schemes. His hobbies included being abusive to his family, expediting trips to heaven for beloved family pets, with which he was less skilled than the previously mentioned. Leslie's life served no obvious purpose. He did not contribute to society or serve his community, and he possessed no redeeming qualities besides quick-witted quick sarcasm, which was amusing during his sober days. And that's not all of it yet. With Leslie's passing, he will be missed only for what he never did. Being a loving husband, father, and good friend. No services will be held. There will be no prayers for eternal peace and no apologies to the family he tortured. Leslie's remains will be cremated and kept in the barn until Ray, the family's donkey's wood shavings run out. <laughs> Leslie's passing proves that evil does in fact die and hopefully marks a time of healing and safety for all. What do you say about that? I mean, seriously, I mean, how sad is it that this man lived this life this way that there was nothing other to say about him than what I just read. Now, we obviously don't know the full story, and we don't know exactly who wrote this and what their perspective was, and we have to keep an open mind to that. But the fact is, is that this thing was printed, it went viral, it crashed the funeral home's website, <laughs> of which it was read, and I'm standing here preaching about it today, and so that in a way is sick in itself. But it is an example, okay, of who we do not and how we do, who we do not want to be or become and how we do not want to live this life that we have been given to where that's all that we can be remembered for. 
And then there's this lady. She had over 530,000 people following her on Facebook, and her name is Norma, and a book just came out about her. Her son, Tim, wrote this book about his journey with his mother. He says he left home when he was 19 years old. He would call or visit his parents in Michigan occasionally, but decades went by, and he eventually realized that he really didn't know his mom after all of this time. His father died in 2014 or 2015, and he knew that his mother could not live by herself because at that time she was 90 years old. And he also, like I said, realized he didn't know her very well. And so he decided that it was time to make that change. And so he remembered some of the conversations. He said that they used to be stilted over the, over the phone. He'd be talking to his dad, and then he'd finally say, Mom, Mom, are you still there? And she would reply and say, Oh, yeah, I'm here. She also, he also remembered a time when he was young, and she found a, a, a joint in his um, denim jacket pocket when she was doing the laundry, and she took it out. She never said a word to him. She wrapped it up in little pieces of paper, wrote him a little note, washed the jacket, put the note and everything back inside the pocket, and it simply said, I wish you wouldn't smoke these things. Love mom. She was, a, she was a woman who, growing up, he says, did not have very many words. And so he wanted to see um, if he could really discover who his mom was in these later years of life. And so, like I said, her, her husband died, his father died. They'd been married 67 years. And two days after her husband died, Norma was diagnosed with um, endometrial cancer. Now remember, she's 90 years old. The doctors recommended a hysterectomy and radiation and chemotherapy. And in her very matter-of-fact way, she said, nope, I'm not doing any of that. And so her son and his wife had retired early, and they had bought an RV. And so they really kind of call themselves nomads in the road. They don't really have a place that they call home. But they invited Norma to come live with them in the RV, and they say it took her about two minutes, and she gave the answer yes. She said, I'm 90 years old, I'm hitting the road, let's go have some fun. I don't want to spend another minute at the doctor's office. And so on that day, August 24th, 2015, Norma, Ramey, and Tim, and the couple's poodle, Ringo, uh, started out on a year-long adventure across the United States. And she's been followed uh, and reported on by um, all the news agencies. She, uh, like I said, had been married for 67 years. She served in the Navy. She was a nurse at a hospital in San Diego during World War II. After that, she lived in Michigan, and she never really got out beyond Michigan. And what I found very interesting as I was reading the book and everything, um, she also was the mother of a child who had died of cancer many years before. And so when her son reflects and talks about her and the interviews that I've heard with him and everything, he says that she lived in his shadow, in the shadow of his father for many, many years. And I also also wonder if, if most likely... Maybe the death of her daughter had something to do with her, her words not being as uh, exuberant as they were there for a while. But in 2015, they pulled out of the RV, and Norma began to have many firsts that she never had had before. She entered the state of Wisconsin for the first time. She had foods that she'd never tried before, buffalo burgers, fried green tomatoes, lobsters, and oysters. She figured out that key lime pie was one of her absolute favorites. And over the course of the year, they traveled nearly 13,000 miles and slept in over 75 locations in 32 states. They visited dozens of national parks, monuments, and recreation areas. She rode in a hot air balloon. She rode on a horse. She got her first pedicure. And at the beginning of their trip, um, Tim talks about how she had never really stepped out and done things, and there are many reasons why. And she decided that when that diagnosis came and when her husband was gone, that she probably didn't have a lot of time left, but she made a choice 
that she was not going to just set back. She was going to try to really experience living fully. People became in awe of her. And so um, she traveled for over a year, and she died at the age of 91 in September of 2016. After her, <coughs> after her death, thousands and thousands and thousands of people began to speak up and speak out about how she had touched their hearts and had inspired them. This is totally opposite to the other guy that I just read to you, his obituary. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. One lady said on the online guest book, you did it your way, honey. God bless you, Norma. Another one said, what a lady. She lived life for the full, to the fullest. Thanks for giving me the inspiration to make the change I needed to make in my life. I lift up both of these people to you today, not because they were extraordinary people. They were simple people, both of them. And even the man who received the car, who was working at the Mexican food restaurant, very, very simple people, not much different than you or I. But all of these can be inspirations about how we can live our lives differently. The first, or the man whose ashes now live with the donkey, is one that we never want to be able to say that we knew someone like that, and we sure don't want someone to reflect on our life one day and say those kinds of things. And then there's Miss Norma that shows us that there really is goodness in this world and there really is life to be lived despite what it is that life may have brought to us previously. That it's never too late to hold on to what we have and to experience in a way letting go of the things that have held us back. The scripture reading from Mark that we heard just a few moments ago reminds all of us that the kingdom of God is found in the awe and the wonder that can often only be seen through the eyes of a child. If you watch children, you know, they just have this wide-eyed curiosity about them that sadly somewhere along the way in our lives we lose. They are open to possibility. They have hearts that are full of love for every one. They see a creation that's been given to us and they want to look at it as like a playground to explore and to find. And relationships are fun and everybody is a friend. And the world is full of grace when you look in their eyes. And somehow, like I said, we grow out of that somewhere along the way. And voices and influence seem to rob us of wonder and curiosity. And somewhere we go from being open to possibility to being fearful of what could happen. We go from having an exuberant, uninhibited view to one that is narrow and full of all of the isms of this world, whether it's racism or class, sexism or class, whatever it may be. We have walls that we build instead of tearing them down. And so that scripture from Mark comes as a reminder to us that, you know, I think the disciples in a lot of ways were sometimes like us, or maybe I should say we are sometimes like the disciples. We scold, we squash down, we want to keep things in control. And Jesus said, let the little children come to me, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. And when we pause and think, it has to be because of the wonder and the curiosity that they bring. Miss Norma comes to us and shows us that there are a lot of people in this world that are in need of a good story. And that's why millions of people followed her and tracked her videos and the stories that her son and daughter-in-law put out there. Because we live in a world that needs inspiration. We need hope. We need love. And it doesn't take someone full of fame and status to give that to us. It takes someone who is willing to live authentically and fully with whatever time they have. Isaiah's words from the prophet Isaiah that we heard um, say to us that where there have been thistles, you know those things that poke and prod us and just drive us absolutely nuts, 
where there have been thorns, the things that that cause us pain. Instead, there is promised to be a great giant sequoia. Where there are briars and thorn bushes, there will now be stately pines. The words, you shall go out, enjoy, and find a full and complete life. For this is a sign of the everlasting promise of God that shall not be cut off. This speaks to each one of us, I hope, on this day, that the promise that the light will never, ever be diminished by the darkness that we may feel or see in this world. That wherever we are here in this place on this morning, there are brighter days ahead. I do believe that. In the midst of sadness and grief and pain, there is still joy and there is still life that is left to be lived. And no matter who we are, And no matter where we've been, no matter what we've done, no matter what we have caused people to go, hmm, about, I believe that even for old Popeye, and even for Miss Norma, and even for each and every one of us, these scriptures remind us that there is still hope for all of us. Amen.